Hello and welcome to the Film Pulse Podcast. This is episode number 437. My name is Adam Patterson. With me today, we've got Kevin Rickstraw. Hey, Kevin. Hey, what's up? Not a whole lot. I'm in my like kind of mobile setup right now, so please excuse the bad audio quality. Uh, I'm, I'm going to work on making it better for next week, but I s- still have some tweaking to do. It's a very, very temporary setup I have going here because I'm in the middle of moving. Uh, anyway, this week on the show, we'll be taking a look at the body horror film A Banquet, which is out now on VOD platforms. We'll also be going over some of what we're watching on the watch list and this week's new releases in theaters, VOD and Blu-ray. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Please remember to review us on iTunes if you get a moment. That'd be very helpful. Uh, new Save by the 90s has been recorded. It is in the can. Just have to go through editing now, and I'm, I'm hoping to have it done by the end of this month. So, <laughs> so, so maybe maybe drop it early early next week. The theme is production. So what? We're, so we're looking at four movies that uh, involve TV, radio, and film production. So those include Quiz Show, Radio Land Murders. Matinee and uh, the the late shift. So very s- some interesting ones there, including one of those ones is flat out the worst movie that I've seen since we started the show. Really, it was a god awful nightmare that I just wanted to be over. So I'll let I'll, I'll let I'll let you all guess which one that that was all right let's talk about a banquet this is directed by ruth paxton i have a synopsis here a widowed mother is radically tested when her teenage daughter insists a supernatural experience has left her body in service to a higher power uh oof. uh kevin we'll start it with you what were your initial impressions of a banquet Oof, boy uh we're recording later than what we normally do. That was to buy myself some time to see if I could muster up anything to say. You had to process this banquet. one, boy. You, had, you yeah, had, yeah. there was there was so much that you had to get. You just had to figure it all out. I sat uh, in a room by myself, just just soaking in it, mm-hmm. trying to you know formulate my opinion on it, but. Uh, in the process of doing that, I forgot every single thing about this movie. <laughs> this is going to be, it, I mean, this is one of those films that just, just occupies that space, you know, of films that it. when you ask me like two years from now, you'll say Banquet, you saw it. And I'll be like, I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Because I'm bit just, this is not going to stick at all. There's just nothing about it. I just... This is a no burn, the old dreaded no burn, and man, it was a rough watch for me. I had a really hard time with this one as well. I think that it it did have a number of things going for it. I think that as far as like body horror goes, uh, there were a couple. It wasn't even. It's not even really a body horror. Like it's a very very light body horror movie. I would say. Yeah. Basically, what you have here is this teenager who she goes to a party. She sees something. There's like a like a blood moon that's that's going on. She goes into the woods. She sees something and then she just doesn't eat anymore and she doesn't get hungry. She doesn't lose weight. She just just doesn't eat. And the whole time I'm thinking like, wow, that would be great if I like financially speaking, if you you just didn't have to eat anymore. (laughs) Like you Ooh, just in time to, too. You, you know oh, how much oh my god! Oh my god! Yeah, I would. I would also like to say that the mom, though, made some exquisite dinners. Wow, yeah, she was she she was bringing her A game, and it seemed like she was trying to utilize that as maybe to get her to start eating. You know, if you make this more appealing, you know, if I really bring my stuff, she surely she'll eat. But after a certain point, I would think like you would just dial it back. Yeah, because she's not eating. She hasn't been eating for like eight months. So it's just, like you don't have to bring your A game every night. 
I don't know. It, it seemed like she genuinely liked to to cook. And then there was the other daughter too. You don't want to. That's you true. Don't wanna, you don't want to just true. leave the other daughter in the lurch. You know, cooking cooking craft mac and cheese. But yeah, so mm, that's pretty much it. Like she doesn't eat, and <laughs> yeah. they try and they try to figure out what's going on. And eventually, she she reveals what the synopsis says here, where it's like there's some sort of like higher power or some something, something going on here. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it, uh, not a lot, not a lot to, to talk about here with this movie. The ending is not surprising or revelatory in any way. I should, I should have mentioned this at the top of the, this review, but we do have a, a written review for this up on the site. Uh, Chris reviewed this for us and uh, he gave it a six and a half out of ten which i think is like really generous extremely generous yes and especially reading his review i just like i couldn't reconcile the two between the words and that number score i think he was a little bit generous i i mean like visually it was fine there were the you know it was decent looking uh i liked what they did with kind of the creepy food stuff where they made even like really appetizing looking meals, kind of disgusting and and like because they would do that like extreme close up into the food and and like elevate all of the the sounds so you can just hear every like little yeah. squish mm-hmm. and so it no, was not a know, bear no uh, and actually I was eating lunch when I watched this and there was one scene that. And, and this rarely happens to me where I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't uh, continue eating during that scene or several minutes after. And it was the scene where she, and this is not like a spoiler or anything. I'm not going to like give away major details about the context, but there's a scene where like, there's kind of like rotten food that's mm. involved and for whatever reason, the, the fact that she looked all like greasy, like her her face mm-hmm. was like oily and greasy, like it, it was just so, and, and just the extreme close ups that they were u- utilizing was uh, very nauseating. And I was just like, no, I'm up. gonna have to put this down. Gonna have to put, put down my sandwich here for a little bit. Oh, no, no, oh, interrupted sandwich time. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't a big deal. It was just a few minutes. I I, I picked it back up like hey, pr- probably by just, the next the next scene. You got, you got right back in that sandwich. I did. Yeah, I mean, it was, I got to imagine that the the sandwich was the far more memorable. It was because I ordered from Subway, and oh, you know, it's just I just a ham ham and cheese sub. You know, I was just looking for something quick, and. Right. They added like 20 pieces of ham on this. Like it was unbearable. The, the amount of ham that they added in this sandwich. So yes, it, 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 the sandwich was more memorable than the movie just because of the volume of ham added. I had to take, I had to like take half of it off more than half. I had to take more than half of it off. A wealth of ham. It was like a joke. I felt like somebody was, was pranking me. Like the the, the 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 person who <laughs> the person who was Give preparing this, sub. yeah, the person who was preparing this at Subway was clearly pranking me. Like I'm gonna give this guy. Oh, you want a ham sandwich? I'll give you a ham sandwich, buddy. And he just loaded probably, it up. The, he, the making of your ham sandwich is probably the viral video on TikTok or something. <laughs> probably, it's just a guy just keeps adding. He's like, how to make a ham sub at Subway. Add ham, add ham, add ham. And it just does that for like the next two yeah. minutes. And then you got the end result. <laughs> that would be so funny though. If I was just scrolling through TikTok and I saw my exact <laughs> sandwich like, being made. Fuck, it's, that's the fucking sandwich. I actually did see a very funny TikTok recently that took place in the subway where it was, it was a guy who was making a sandwich. And he's like, oh, do you want it toasted? And he's like, yeah, I want it toasted. And he, he toasts it and he pulls it out. He's like, can you make it a little bit more toasted? And he puts it in again. And he's like, uh, can you make it a little bit more toasted again? And he just kept asking the guy to put it back in and toast it more until it came out completely black. Oh, God. Uh, shit. Yeah. So a banquet is, uh, you know, there's a couple interesting things. I do like the so, so the, the main character. Uh, what's her name? Jessica Alexander. She was in 
that movie that I spoke about. I saw it it, called Glass House. I can't remember what festival I saw that in. She was she was really good in that too, and and I think she's she was quite good in this. But you know that's it doesn't necessarily save the 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 overall plot from just being just it's so so minimal, so little to to really grasp onto here. Yeah, there's a bit. It was just. For me, I got in terms of the plot and the narrative. I'm just waiting for something to happen. Like the initial setup, I'm like, okay, this is interesting. I see where we go with this, but I just I felt like they never really went anywhere with it, and then it just all of a sudden stops. It just no, ends. I mean, and and that's the thing is like the setup is kind of intriguing. Like, oh well, why? What did she see in the woods? Why? Why does she no longer need to eat? Like. Where is this all going to go? But unfortunately, where it does go is a bit of a wet noodle. It just doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't, it I doesn't mean, go they, anywhere. No. And I mean, they add some stuff. They add some elements to it. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, a lot of that stuff was just like too too late, too little, too late for me. But even then, it still was like, OK, well, there's still a chance that something's going to happen. You know, you find out more about like when her when her grandma shows up. And kind of shares a, a memory of her as a child, and mm-hmm. you're like, oh, okay, so she has a history of of, of, of a certain activity, you know? Okay, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then you find out a little bit more about the mother, and you're like, okay, well, there's still, it seems like something's coming together here, you know? Like we're we're slowly getting there, but again, it just just stops. And there's a one aspect. There's one scene. Um, where there's some good effects and that's really the only scene that like had anything that I felt was remotely engaging, but at the same time it felt completely uh, like it, it just didn't fit with what they were doing with this movie. It just, it felt like an excuse to show a little, you know, a cool special effect. And then that's it. Mm-hmm. We're done. And yeah. then on top of that, you have all that that's just not working for me at all. And then the cinematography of this thing is just so unbelievably generic and just nothing didn't work at all. The sound design, the, you know, the score, every all those all those aspects just did nothing for me at all. The performances are like okay, you know, they're serviceable. It's just nothing here was engaging in any way. I agree. Yeah. Just yeah, not feel not feeling it unfortunately. So, yeah, this this did not work for me. No, oh, and I just like and I'm still trying to like figure out what what it what it is. Like I don't I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know what any of it means. Yeah, I don't I, I I don't know either. I mean, may, maybe I missed some allegory or something. You know, initially it seemed like it was going to be about eating disorders, but because there was the yeah, whole the and- whole thing like the the whole thing that happens in the opening scene when the the father dies by I don't, it's, it's, I don't know if it's a spoiler. It happens in the opening scene, but he yeah. consumes something. And I thought, oh, okay, well, maybe, maybe that's what why she develops this this eating disorder, or, or you know, what is rep this this thing that represents an eating disorder? Yeah, uh, but and you're just uh, you're thinking like, okay, maybe trauma, maybe mm-hmm. stress. I you know, and I kept waiting for like something, something to connect it all. And I just feel like nothing got connected or there was even an attempt to connect anything. Or maybe I just completely, because there was also that because it was so difficult for me to engage with, like as a whole, I kept thinking to myself, I'm like, surely I missed something. Like I must've just like blacked out, Mm -hmm. you know, like my eyes just went blank and my mind just wandered and I completely missed like something very important. And I kept thinking that, like, you know, like every 10 minutes, I'm like, surely I missed something. I had to. 
but I don't I don't know if I did honestly. Yeah, Maybe was, I did. I, I, I don't know. know. Yeah, I mean, if if you missed it, I missed it too. I I feel like there wasn't a whole lot to miss. I mean, it all felt pretty straightforward, but I don't know. I don't understand the 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 scale like the logistics of it, like what they were I just, it just, none of it worked. Just none of it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and give it a score. What are you going to give a banquet out of 10? I give a banquet to two. Uh, I am at a three on this one that is available now on VOD at the guy I've midnight is the one they're the ones who put that out let's move on and talk about someone watching i started the week off with the cursed which is playing now in theaters actually this was a theatrical release uh, directed by sean ellis and this is kind of a it's kind of a, a folk horror you know it's it's kind of still hopping on that folk horror trend this is a little bit different in that there's significantly more action to it basically what you have here is these uh these these douchebag landowners who steal the land from these gypsies and and they end up like killing everybody in the gypsy camp and they before they before they get killed they they curse the families of uh the people who who did this and uh, it kind of turns into like a werewolf type thing. It's decent. Uh, there's some pretty good creature effects in here. Pretty gory. It's weird that this was in theaters. It feels more like a VOD release, but the, I, I guess maybe the production values a little bit higher than what you see on a lot of VOD releases, but I don't know. Kind of middle of the road for me. Yeah, it it looks it looks that way. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I saw the Oscar nominated Lee, directed mm. by Jonas Poard uh, Rasmussen. Mm-hmm. The the animated like quasi documentary type deal. Have you seen this? Have you seen Flea? I haven't. I believe it was Ken who I think I think it was on the the year end podcast when he talked about this. Mm. Yeah. So it's it's available on Hulu now. So I checked this out. Um, this is one of those things, uh, one of those movies that I feel like is it's like you can't really critique it. You know, it's a it's a pretty straightforward documentary where. It, this guy, Amin, who came to Denmark as an unaccompanied minor from Afghanistan. And he's kind of had this secret his entire life that, you know, the secret that he had to perpetuate in order to gain asylum to be in Denmark. So now he's older. He's very successful. Uh, he's getting ready to get married to his longtime boyfriend. So his, a friend of his, the filmmaker, decides, you know, they decide together that he's gonna go over his story you know he's finally gonna let everyone know what what exactly happened you know so this is really tough for him to go through and essentially they use the uh, they do animation is in order to like to, to mask who he is you know doesn't use the real names everything like that so a lot of it is just animated like him being interviewed by his friend. So there's that going on in the present day, obviously. And then when he's talking about the past, it's animated, you know, kind of like a a visual interpretation of what the past was for him. It's a really affecting story. Uh, It's enthralling and it keeps you hooked. And it's a, it's a hell of a story. I mean, Jesus Christ, but (laughs) I don't know. At the same time, just like, you know, it was good. It just like, it didn't wow me in any way. Mm. 
Okay. That is Flea available now on Hulu. F L E E. I saw the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which dropped on Netflix this weekend, this past weekend. It's bad. Uh, it's directed by David Blue Garcia. I did. I had no expectations going into it, so I really didn't. I, I wasn't surprised that it was not good. Maybe the premise is is kind of okay. So what you have here is a a group of of twenty somethings who they buy a town. Basically, they they buy the entire town. It's like because it's a it's a ghost town. It was it was abandoned. So they they buy it up and they're gonna revitalize it. They're gonna turn it into this like kind of hipster mecca. And turns out one of the houses that they buy is Leatherface's house. Oh, it's, no. it's where Leatherface is living. Now the premise of this one is or, or like sort of where it fits in the timeline. They did what what uh they did on the the new the latest Halloween reboot where they they kind of retcon the whole thing and only the first one is is canon so they they did away with all the other sequels Mm -hmm. and leatherface is living in this like orphanage and the the original uh, uh woman who who survived the the first film she she comes back and attempts to she's like i'm gonna i'm gonna kill him Mm -hmm. sally sally is uh, the character's name played by uh olwyn fiori i'm probably mispronouncing that apologies uh it's just uh it's just not good no no good no good yeah that sounds terrible it's really gory it's really gory Uh, i'll give it that i mean there's a lot of severed limbs and really graphic uh kills in this but it's just uh nothing there's just nothing special it's at the end of the day it's just a really generic it's a really generic slasher movie and you know comparing this to to like the uh the the remake the original Texas Chainsaw remake that I keep think came out in like 2003 the the Michael Bay produced one like mm-hmm. that was so much better than this like at least with that one, there were some really interesting visuals with it. Like the, the the cinematography was was there was some really crazy stuff in that original remake. I think, and I, I think that it's starting to get more credit now than it did back when it came out. But there's some wild stuff in that one, and um, but this one is just so generic. None of the characters are partic- particularly memorable or likable. The the ending is kind of interesting. I think that that's probably the best part is the final, the final shot, the final scene that that happens. That is uh, is kind of they they it harkens back to the original. I think it's time for Terrence Hill, Bud Spencer. Oh, oh. talking about some that, some odds and evens, huh? You did. You got to see this. Whoever's yeah. listening, you got to see it. Got to check it out. I think the first thing, the first thing that jumped out to me that got me pretty excited for this is it's Sergio Cabucci is the director. The guy that made The Great Silence and Django. Like, come on. Mm-hmm. This is going to be, this is going to be something else. And then watching this movie, it is, it's a fucking mess. But it kind of in a good way. But it also feels like it's a Terrence Hill and Bud Spencer movie. Obviously, but it feels like it's 20 of those <laughs> and they just pick some scenes from each one and just put them on shuffle. I really wonder if there's some kind of translation thing that's happening here or something, because this movie makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Like the whole time, I'm just like, wait a minute. Like, OK, they seem they were strangers when they met each other, now they keep calling each other brother. And then there's like that one guy that's like pretending to be their dad, but he's not their dad. And he was like pretending to be blind, but he's not blind. And, yeah, and it just n- none of it makes any sense whatsoever. But that didn't necessarily detract 
from it for me. <laughs> I still had a it helped. Uh, yeah, I still had a blast because you don't know what's coming next. You're just like, oh, what 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 is next? What could possibly oh, all of a sudden he's an ice cream. He's an ice he's he's selling ice cream now. Like I guess I guess Bud Spencer, that's like one of his side gigs. And then all of a sudden, oh wait, he's a high life player now. <laughs> like Which what is I going think on? Has to be- the most incredible thing I've ever seen. Cause before the highlight sequence and the, the highlight sequence comes at the, the, the end of a long procession of them just doing stuff, gambling wise, just, you know, trying stuff out, you know, they're doing demolition derbies, all sorts of shit. So they finally get to the highlight thing, but I like that. What, what precedes it is him, Bud Spencer going to visit a buddy of his. that is just an absolute shit shape. I mean, this guy is just a fucking mess. I mean, he's got a beer belly. I, like, his legs barely even work. He has to wear a wig because he's balding. Like, there's no way in hell that you look at this guy and you're thinking, well, he's a highlight player, definitely. But that's what ends up happening is Bud Spencer wears the guy's wig and stands in for him. <laughs> yeah. And plays as him, which Bud Spencer's does not have the build for Highlight. Like, he would not succeed in Highlight. <laughs> but this is the Terrence Hill Bud Spencer world, so of course he's a fucking master at it. And just him wearing the ridiculous outfit, and then when he would cut to his character doing something athletic, and you could clearly see that it was a scrawny guy wearing, like, a bunch of pillows... It was just, it was incredible. Just, I mean, my God, this movie is. And I feel, I wanted to go back. Because when they first introduced Terrence Hill, which, again, completely bonkers. He's a Navy. He's in the Navy. Mm -hmm. He's a lieutenant. But I'm pretty sure that they did not call him Furpo. And then at some point, he's just Furpo. And they're brothers. And I'm so confused. Yeah, I... I, I also want to go back and rewatch this because there's something to it here. Like I feel like I missed something. That there's yeah, <laughs> there's there's so bonkers. much. And then all of a sudden, like he's kind of losing him, and he's like, "Brother," and it's like, "Wait, what? You guys are brothers now?" And then he tricks him with the dad thing. So I thought that the whole thing was just this elaborate ruse from Terrence Hill because that's what he seems to be doing with everyone. Is the he, he tricks people, and I thought, well, man, this is an elaborate one. He's he's essentially got Bud Spencer thinking that he's his brother, and this is his dad. But none like, of this it. Is, n- this is insane. But then towards the end, they're like, both of their last names are Furpo, and they're brothers. And it's yeah, like, wait, did they just believe it so much <laughs> that his last name changed <laughs> and they became related? Uh, yeah, I I have no idea, and also like. It, it was like it was like Terrence Hill immediately forgot his mission. Like, like yes. he just he just threw that whole thing to the wayside. Like he just wants to become friends with Bud Spencer and get him to gamble. I guess like it just it's so it's just so none of it. Like the whole mission thing with him trying to manipulate yeah. him into like exposing the this this mob activity and stuff like none of that makes any sense either <laughs> no and it is really interesting because you're right he, like and i love this about these uh, hill and spencer movies because it seems like that's the gist of all of them is terrence hill wants to be buddies with bud spencer and bud spencer wants nothing to do with the guy he just, he just wants some some beans and onions that's yeah all that's he, all he wants is he just, he just wants, he just to, wants eat to eat his eat. beans and <laughs> he wants to eat his beans and onions order an entire cake and just be left alone. But then, you know, through the power of them slapping people in the face and hitting people with sticks and bonking them, they end up becoming like the best of friends. Such good friends that they actually become blood related. It's And it actually affects the entire timeline of reality. And it, it, like, it's incredible. And it's, he's got an apple, an apple, that has a antenna that communicates with dolphins. Yeah. You can speak dolphinese, but Spencer can speak seagullese. Like, 
this movie is just fucking insane. It is. I was I was a little worried because when we started this whole thing, I was like, oh man, like I I maybe maybe the rest of them aren't gonna be. Yeah. You know, to my liking, like maybe the re- maybe it's just that the the first one, the watch out, we're mad, <laughs> like. But yeah, we I think started I think, off with the pinnacle. Yeah, but I think odds and evens has has proven to me that uh, there there is plenty more fun to be had with oh, yeah. with this, uh, these two. I think this one is got closer to the watch out, we're mad in yeah. that the slapstick's really good. I enjoyed the slapstick. Like it's just so ridiculous the, that it yeah, ends up becoming absolutely hilarious because they're just doing so much. It's just constantly them doing. It's just a set new piece thing. after set piece. Yeah. Like it, everything is an excuse to showcase some kind of weird set piece, be and it I, you know a race or just a fight or whatever. Yeah, high lie. It, it's it's incredible. Yeah, high lie. Come on. I mean, he's playing football in the Army Navy game. And then immediately oh, yeah, he's that. boat racing. <laughs> the boat, yeah, the boat race, yep. Uh, and I, I, I particularly enjoyed that a lot of the comedy in this one is just downright stupid, and mm-hmm. I loved it. I love that Terrence Hill somehow gets himself into a, a horse carriage race, even though he's <laughs> way too big to be a jockey. But he does it, and the guy that he's racing beside is like, "Hey, you're not so and so." He's like, yeah, I am. He's like, yell out my name. See if I respond. So the guy's like, hey, Sal. And he's like, yeah, see, I'm Sal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's great. Oh, my God. Fucking Odds and evens. Sell. Check it out. I can't wait. I can't wait to for the next one. It's just, it's so. And then incorporate the comedy into, like, the, the choreographed fighting and slapping and everything. It's just, it's so dumb. Just dumb as hell. And I love it. Yep. 100% agree. All right. Uh, I saw Licorice Pizza, finally. The uh, Paul Watch Thomas and- Paul Thomas Anderson. Uh, I loved it. It was it was great. I, I suspected that this would have had a, a place on my top 10. It definitely would have. I don't know. I don't know if it would have been like number one, but top five, certainly. It's just a fun, lighthearted comedy, and I just I had a great time with it. Alana Haim and Cooper Hoffman do a great job. I mean, these are people who uh, Cooper Hoffman. I think this is his debut. It's uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's son, and uh, Alana Haim is. I, I don't know if she's done much acting in the past either, but they do a great job. You have a really great supporting cast here. Lots of fun cameos like Sean Penn, who plays this completely off his rocker, uh, like celebrity Tom Waits in there. Bradley Cooper, who plays another like completely insane. uh, He he plays the boyfriend of Barbara Streisand. Benny Safdie's in here in a role that he's he's like, uh, I can't remember. He's he's running for office, I believe. I can't. Remember if it's like mayor or Congress or something. Um, but he, it's definitely not a role that I've, ex- I would expect him to be in. So lots of, lots of great performances, lots of great music in this. I loved the, the cinematography. It had a very kind of vintage 70s look to it. And uh, yeah, I can highly recommend Licorice Pizza. It was a, a great time. See if I ever watch this thing. I don't know if you will. I don't know I just, if it, I don't know what it is. I just can't. I just can't muster any like excitement for this. It's. And I it's, don't know why. It's just. It's a very kind of slight film that just kind of washes over you. I mean, it's it's over two hours long, and a lot happens. But it's all just kind of, you know, just it just, just kind of meanders and it is what it is. And you just spend some time with some likable characters and they get into some shenanigans and there's a lot of waterbeds. Like he, 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 uh, Cooper Hoffman, he, he plays a 15 year old child actor in here 
and he's he's a real entrepreneur. He's a go getter, and he ends up opening a waterbed store. He's only fifteen, but he opens up a waterbed store, <laughs> and so a, a large portion of the movie is them like selling waterbeds and setting up waterbeds in celebrities' homes and stuff. It's great. I might watch it. I saw two movies by Penelope Spheris. Uh, these are movies that I've of hers that I've been meaning to watch forever and just never got around to it. And I was just kind of looking for something to watch. And, you know, I was like, you know what? I'm going to check Tubi. I'm going to check the old Tubi. And lo and behold, that pretty much like every Penelope Spheris movie that she made is on Tubi. So I started off with Suburbia from 1983. This is a this is a great movie. It's uh, it's pretty wild. So it, it follows uh, a group of kind of um, like a ragtag group of misfits. They're all like punk kids and they're living in this abandoned house. There's this like housing development that was, that was bought by the County and then abandoned. And uh, it's just sort of them trying to live their lives, going to punk shows, being, being wild, getting into scraps, fighting, trying to get away from the cops and the, 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 people of the town think that they're all like weirdos and freaks outcasts. The movie opens with a, an infant being murdered by a dog being attacked and killed by a dog, which is insane. And there's another, there's like multiple child deaths that happen in this movie that are like pretty shocking (laughs) because it doesn't necessarily fit the tone, but and the opening, the opening with the kid getting killed by the dog is just really out of left field. Like it doesn't really fit the theme of the, the uh, well, maybe a little bit, but it's, it's shocking. It's a shocking way to open a movie. So yeah, Suburbia is great. I can definitely recommend that. And again, it's on Tubi. Another one that's on Tubi. This one just auto played right after Suburbia. And I just let it, I just let it roll, man. I was like, all right, we're in it. What, what do you got for me? And that's Hollywood Vice Squad from 1986. This was this one was awesome, too. Uh, again, Penelope Spheris. This is sort of a uh, supposedly it it takes real true cases of the of the Vice Squad and sort of presents them in in this movie where it's there's kind of like an overarching narrative, but but then they they do like these kind of smaller busts where they're like going after prostitutes and um, drug dealers and stuff like that. Carrie Fisher's in this. She plays one of the undercover vice squad cops. And uh, so is Joey Travolta. I, I enjoyed this one. This is also kind of totally off. Like some of it feels a little goofy, but a lot of it feels very serious, but had a good time with it. Nonetheless, it, it is kind of all over the place. It's very messy. Like they'll just, they'll do, they'll go one play one place with it. And you'll think that this is where the movie's going to go, but then they'll like abandon that or just throw that aside and then go to this other, like larger case that they're working on. And it's just kind of just very, very frantic, just all over the place, but still, still good time. Good, good eighties crime action movie and Penelope Spheris, man, she's a really great director. And I feel like the industry just did her dirty and and she ended up leaving. She, she left the industry because they, they dicked her over. It was a, I think a Weinstein thing happened where she, he, I think he like blacklisted her or something. Not surprising. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at what we have in theaters this week. Only one to mention, then that's Studio Six Six Six, which is a it's a horror comedy from the Foo Fighters. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's so, right. Yep. Incredible. It's gonna be in theaters. Wow, they're just desperate, man. They're just desperate to get whatever they can into theaters these days. Yeah. This looks atrocious. Yeah, this just, this, a lot of bad ideas, it seems like. Yeah, that's pretty much it for theaters. On VOD this week, on the 22nd, we have Hard Hit, 
It looks like a crime thriller, maybe. We got Dunk or Die. That's a documentary about slam dunking. About slam dunking. (laughs) Yeah. This guy says (laughs) about slam dunking. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, uh, it's the uh, it's the triumphant story of F- France's slam dunk superstar, Kador Ziani. A slam dunk superstar. Yeah, give or take. Uh, is that a maybe? A, it sounds like a rom com. Let's see. It's yeah, slam dunking. Looks like a looks like a rom com. We have Beowulf. Oh, yeah. uh, which is a it's kind of like a take on Beowulf, I think. Gotcha. But it's about slam dunking. Yes, exactly. Yes. We got Hellbender coming out on the 24th on Shudder. Nice. Definitely recommend that. Then on Friday, the 25th, we have Strawberry Mansion. Uh, recommend that too. Indeed. It's the uh, Albert Bernie, Kentucker, Audley. That's two good, two good movies coming out. Mm-hmm. The Burning Sea. That looks like uh, something about an oil field uh, disaster. Maybe we also have I'll Find You. This is a uh, romance movie. We got The Desperate Hour with Naomi Watts. Riveting, riveting, and pulse pounding thriller. To so look out for that. We got Big Gold Brick. Big, is it gold Big Gold Brick. Brick recounts the story of fledgling writer Samuel Liston and his experiences with Floyd Devereaux, the enigmatic middle-aged father of two, who enlists Sam- Samuel to write his biography. Interesting. This, Os- this seems... Andy Garcia, Oscar Isaac, Megan Fox, from the looks of it. Yeah, this is one of those things that just looking at the the poster and the cast here, it, it, like the, I feel like this movie was made a while ago. <laughs> Could be, yeah, it's just now getting really. Like, this was made back in like 2017. Yeah, could be. Let's see. We have creation stories also coming out. This is the. Uh, biopic about Alan McGee, who is the guy who created the uh, the record label of uh, the record label that that uh, had like Oasis on it, and he he was one of the kind of people who spearheaded that that whole kind of I don't know what you would call it the second British invasion during the nineties when like Oasis and Blur and All those bands started exploding. It's bad. It's very bad, actually. Gotcha. We got Family Squares coming out. This, I believe, is a is like a it's a family drama, but I think that it all takes place on Zoom. It's like a something video video chat type movie. We got Gasoline Alley coming out with Devin Sawa. Ooh, yeah, Devin Sawa. Bruce Willis and Luke Wilson. Wow. Incredible. Incredible. Yes. Sava's making a comeback, man. He's been cranking them out lately. He, he's been, he's on that, uh, that Chucky show on sci-fi and he's been in a whole bunch of movies. So I, f- I feel like he's making a comeback. We need, somebody needs to give him like something really meaty for him to really just break through. Yeah, Gasoline Alley. Uh, maybe. Maybe that's the one. I, I doubt it. This is a Saban Films release, so I would probably guess that it's middling at best, but who knows. Uh, finally, we have Let Me Be Me, which is, a, I believe, a documentary about a, a an autistic uh, young man who is like really into fashion design and he like becomes a fashion designer. Yeah. On Netflix, we got restless coming out. That's on the 25th. We got 
Tyler Perry's a Medea Homecoming. Oh boy. Yeah. On uh I missed one here on the 23rd on Netflix. There's 11 M Terror in Madrid, which looks to be a documentary. Blu-ray this week, we got Alligator from 1980 that's coming out in 4K. Green Miles getting a 4K release. Night of the Demon from 1980. Uh, Escape from L.A. from 1996 getting a 4K release. Drop Dead Fred from 1991 is getting a limited edition release. It's got a really great cover. Classic. This is uh, Vinegar Syndrome. It's putting this out. Wow. Yeah. Man on the Moon getting a new Blu-ray release. Hurt Locker coming out in 4K. Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy 4K. King's Man is coming out. I was gonna sit, I was gonna watch that today. That's on HBO Max. Yeah, it's uh, on HBO Max. Sorry, huh? I was looking at this drop dead Fred. It's a good cover, isn't it? I, I enjoy it. I yeah. enjoy it. The King's Man is coming is out on HBO Max oh, right now. Wait, watch out. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I wasn't clamoring to see it, but no, you were die. You had that shit penciled in on your calendar. It's probably a fun watch, but certainly wasn't something that I needed to see in theaters. Bloody pit of horror from 1965 <clears throat> black candles from 1982. These are all, these are vinegar syndrome alligator to the mutation from 1991 hard target getting a new 4k release. Recommend that. House of Gucci coming out. That was uh, not great. Wasn't horrible. Sister Sister from 1987. Beware Children at Play from 1989. That's the trauma, oh, the trauma movie. That I believe that was either the first or second. It was one of the very first movies that we had Ryan oh, yeah. watch. Without a doubt, it it had to be. It was definitely first five episodes. But it might, yeah, first it might six. Be. It's it's got to at least be first six. Yeah, yeah. We got Wolfpack from 1987. Uh, Sh- Sharon and then Terry's Revenge. Sharon slash Terry's Revenge from 1977. I guess they're two different movies. Uh, I'm not sure what those are all about. They look like maybe they're like softcore porn movies, but I'm not sure. <laughs> we got Side Out from 1990. That looks like a, some kind of teen sex comedy, maybe. Deadly Games from 1982. Lies and Deceit. F- five films by uh, Claude Chabral. Oh, that's, yeah. That's going to be out on Arrow. It's an Arrow box set. Uh, Billitus from 1977. Not sure what that's all about. That looks like it might be like some kind of porn, too. It's a limited edition. What is Billitus? Fun City Editions. Bill, I, how do you even spell that? I've never B- heard this as a word. Oh, it's a vinegar syndrome. Okay. B-I-L-I-T-I-S. Uh, the, the story I... takes place in England around the beginning of the 20th century, sensually exploring a young schoolgirl's awakening to love during her summer vacation. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Sounds like a exploitation to me. Yep. Jeez, there's a lot of stuff coming out this week. The Devil's The Devil's Men from 1976, Voices from 1974, Chomps from 1979. What is this? Is this a dog cop that I'm looking at here? Is this a movie about a dog cop? Please. It's Please. the world's first computerized watchdog. So it's a robot. Oh my it's god. A, it's a robot dog cop. <laughs> oh, you gotta be. Uh, invent a robot dog that has super strength, x-ray vision, and can s- detect crimes being committed. Okay. Oh, and, shit. Uh, and it's on Tubi. Where else do you think you would find it? Well, I'm adding it to my watch list right <laughs> oh. now. <laughs> so <laughs> That fucker's on Tubi. Not of surprised. Of course it's on Tubi. I'm telling you, man. Like, we made fun of Tubi a lot when, like, back when it started to become a thing. But now, oh, it's dude. it's quickly becoming my number one <laughs> streaming service. It's fucking go-to. 
girlfriend from yeah. like there's just so much on it like there's so much anyway there's, uh, they got chops yeah girlfriend from hell from 1989 harry and the hendersons from 1987 harry and the hendersons a suitable job for a woman from 1982 uh cold war creatures four films from sam katzman it's another arrow release Dead and Buried from 1981 is getting a Blue Underground release. Uh, I mean, this is it's too much. I, I, I'm going to end it there because there's just too much stuff. He's, he's done. He's done. Yeah, that those are pretty much the biggies anyway. A lot of other re-releases and stuff like that. Uh, what about Criterion's? Oh, we have one, and that's Boat People, and who from uh, 1982. I've been wanting to see this one for a while, so I'm pretty excited about this. Nice. Yes. Cool. Uh, all right. That's going to do it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. You can send us your questions and topics to podcast at filmpulse.net. You can follow us on Twitter at filmpulse.net or at filmpulse Kevin. And if you have a minute, consider reviewing us on iTunes. That would be much appreciated. For Kevin Rakestraw, my name is Adam Patterson. We'll see you next week. Bye.